Hey guys, Bud Cat Seven here. Okay, it is Thursday, December tenth, twenty twenty, and I'd like to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. I really do appreciate it. All right, guys. Well, as I've often done in the past, I've singled out a particular account from among the accounts that I happen to be reading about or doing at the time, and we just covered Germany, so. Many of those accounts were 20th century, and some even late 20th century in the 80s, if I remember correctly. So, you know, this one in particular is very interesting because it's quite old and a very uh, rather ambitious undertaking by these people back then to do this sort of thing. And what's so very interesting about it, too, is it seems to be about as official, quote-unquote, official as it gets. So, but, you know, often when, you know, they cover these things and, you know, again, when they review these things, you'll hear them talk about whether these large bones that were found were, you know, they were mistaking these things for animal bones and bear bones in particular. You know, bear bones are very rarely found anywhere in nature. But, you know, obviously they do die and go somewhere or whatever. They're just not particularly found because the bears go into some remote area, whatever it is. But they'll say those sorts of things there. But this account sort of, uh, you know, squashes all of that really because, you know, it's very, very old. But And that's what makes some of it so interesting. But I think, you know, we all have to get our forensic hats on, our NCIS hats on for lack of a better term i knew a lot of cops and also uh, military people in my time and they always would comment about whatever these cop shows or military shows that you see on tv are all a bunch of baloney you know and nothing to do with reality whatsoever but in any case um it's very interesting these accounts it makes me also think about a bunch of things you know it's Often the naysayers and the skeptics will say, well, you know, this is what they're, you know, mistaking the bones or whatever because they're just ignorant. You know, people of that time were ignorant. I find that very hard to believe at a time where, you know, there was no grocery stores, no supermarkets, no places to go, no butcher shop or anything like that. There's just the slaughtering of animals going on everywhere, okay, and... Also, you know, battlefields littered with human bones everywhere, just rotting away in the sun and all this, you know, and he's trying to say that people couldn't differentiate between the bones. It didn't know skeletal anatomy all the way back to like ancient Greece and Rome and everything. I find it ridiculous. Okay, so, and, you know, we read in the accounts when the Giants, when we were doing that in the Americas here and, you know, doing it state by state, where some old publication like over 100 years ago was saying about how people who specialize in those fields have got it down, you know, have, uh, you know, perfected that sort of uh, skill, you know, had, you know, were able to identify them very easily. So, you know, this whole thing and, you know, they, they didn't know because they're just so ignorant, it, you know, it just happened so long ago. And, and it also made me think of, you know, this film by Jan Svankmacher. And I don't know if you've ever seen any of this guy's work. He did one called Faust and one called Alice based on like Alice in Wonderland. But it's the most disturbing and weird thing you've ever seen in your life. And this guy was just like a filmmaker, this foreign filmmaker. I forget what country he's from right now, so I apologize for that. But it just his films are so weird. And, it, you know, he did this based on a real thing, this ossuary, this, you know, large, you know, sort of religious, you know, Christian, you know, religious complex here where all these bones of, I guess, of monks that had died over the centuries, you know, century upon century, century. And they created some sort of art with these things. And, you know, you know saying, you know, back when it, just so ignorant they couldn't tell the difference but when you look at this you know whether it's like 17th century or 18th century i'm not sure or 19th century maybe i'm not i'm not quite sure when this was done but you look at what they've done with this thing here and you know 
Spunk Maher, you know, is taking you through this place here and looking at all the art work done with the bones of these uh, just unbelievable and so weird and you know i mean i guess grotesquely beautiful is the only thing you could say about it what what can you say but that was the intent to create these works of art with the human bones and placing them all specifically in these places you know these people obviously took a tremendous amount of time to do this and it's still you know underneath the building there i think there's still like tens of thousands of bones and skull remains you know but they created this and i'll put a link to this film i mean if you've never seen any of this guy's work you you must if you're into like some of the weirdest stuff that you've ever seen i saw this on somebody else's channel like, way back when it's just evidently some uh you know maybe russian or polish or slavic channel or something like that so i don't know but it's just insane what they've done with the human bones here so you just you know all those ignorant people back then and i was watching uh for whatever reasons i was watching Sherlock Holmes, Hound of the Baskervilles there, which obviously takes place in the UK. I forget exactly where they say, where they have these moors and all this kind of stuff, where they have these Neolithic constructions, these stone houses, as they call them. And listen to what they say in this uh, at sort of this point in the uh, Hound of the Baskervilles here. They have the neighbors, you know, this you know, old curmudgeon over here, is just, you know... A, a nasty old guy who's one of the neighbors and a stapleton here is the neighbor of Henry Baskerville who's inherited this place has come from Canada or whatever so they're talking here at the dinner table here and the old man is accusing Stapleton who's the bad guy we don't know that till the end but listen to what he says and an excellent vintage it is too but if you're implying that I'm tipsy sir oh of course he's not tell us more Mr. Franklin Whose body has Mr. Stapleton been snatching? According to my evidence, sir, Mr. Stapleton was seen digging among the old stone huts on the moor and removed from there a skull. <laughs> oh, that? <laughs> a most interesting relic, Sir Henry, of Neolithic man. I'll show it to you after dinner. 50,000 years old if it's a day. Nonetheless, sir, you removed it from the grave without the consent of the neck. Okay, so he removed the skull from among these Neolithic constructions, which, you know, in my opinion, are what I call out of place architecture, because they never, you know, explain these things. Yeah, there it is Neolithic. Here in the Americas couldn't be any such thing, but unfortunately for them, Jimmy and I found evidence for this out on Mount Ephraim in Vermont when we were hiking up there along the trail up there at Mount Ephraim along the stone wall in which there was a serpent effigy construction built right into it. And one of the many that I found in was, and of course, that's my own uh discovery about the walls if you don't know anything about the stone walls of new england you better bone up on them because i'm I, I you know i fare pretty importantly in the scope of the people who do this sort of research because of my discovery of this that all the walls in the northeast are all serpents they have the effigies and many other effigies in the walls as well built into the walls just everywhere there people send me their emails pictures of their areas some you know hundreds of miles away to have just the identical effigies in a wall so look it's just you know don't listen to them but you know jimmy and i found these neolithic constructions these uh you know um dolmen in the mountainous region up there among stone walls that were very very curious some of them built on like vertical parts of the mountain there which is just incredible why anybody would do that is ridiculous there has to be some other reasons but in any case you can see those videos on my channel as well and um just again you have to put on your sort of forensic hat here 
and remember everything that's been said on this channel about the quote-unquote giants or large hominids that are all over this planet, but in particular, interesting and dramatic stories that we're hearing about here through these accounts. Okay, so again, this one is very old. And just to talk about it a little bit further, here they have these off-net caves in apparently Germany. Okay, and it's just what they call this underground karst system, which is all these uh, hollowed out caves of, you know, weaker material being cleared out from in there um, in some natural fashion from the much harder material and left these caves. Evidently, this is what they're saying that it is in this particular article in uh, Wikipedia, the online baloney encyclopedia they don't say much here but let me read it to you here because again they say these things here and like he, the uh, stapleton said there's about fifty thousand years old at the very least so you know fifty thousand years old these skulls there among these stone buildings among the neolithic times supposedly these people were building these buildings if that's true it might be a lot sooner than what he was saying there but who are these people? The people, you know, according to all, you know, who is living with us in the past, you know, overlapped a little bit by the Neanderthals. But then the rest of the human beings and hominids on a planet are all supposed to be like us. No different than us, you know. It's saying they identify these things as, you know, Paleolithic, Neolithic, whatever it is, because of the shape of their skulls and all this kind of stuff. And you've seen this reflected in mass media, etc. They're make, making these people look a certain way or whatever. Why should it be any different? They don't say they're any different. Academics doesn't say we're any different than we were 200,000 years ago. And when they do all these specials and everything, they show us just as we appear 200,000 years ago with, you know, furs on and all this kind of stuff, running around with spears and whatnot. Okay, we look identical that we do today. So who are, what, who are they talking about? You know, you get all confused with what they say because they don't know what they're saying either. And they don't want to admit to all these other things that come up that are inexplicable. But let me read this to you. The offline case of the remains of an underground car system on the edge of Nordlinga Reese in Germany. They are located on a limestone hill near Nordlingen, Bavaria. The caves became famous in 1908. 1908 when 33 prehistoric human skulls were discovered prehistoric human skulls were discovered you know they were obviously prehistoric i guess by maybe their shape or whatever it is this is often how they referred to in these articles from the victorian period when you wouldn't think they lived them because you know all this sort of archaeological stuff and anthropological stuff was in its nascency back it was just being formed as a discipline Okay, these things don't go way back in time or anything like that. Every, you know, almost everything with an ology on the end of it that you can name has happened within the last 200, 250 years. You know, it's not like real old tried and true stuff. We're still learning all about this stuff now. He's really in like a primitive caveman stage when you look at it, when the possibilities open up to you about how much we could know, right? So, look, just don't think we're so smart. We're not. The skulls were dated to the Mesolithic period, okay? But they don't give a lot of details about it. There were two caves or rock shelters called the Gross and Klein Opnet, large and small Opnet, in the Gross Opnet in 1908. Archaeologist R. R. Schmidt found two dish-shaped pits in which human skulls were lying like eggs in flat baskets. In the larger pit were 27 skulls and the other that there were six skulls. The skulls were arranged concentrically with their faces turned towards the setting sun. They were all covered with a thick layer of red ochre. The skulls have been dated to the seventh dated to the seventh millennium BC, and you know you have to be very suspicious of that. The further back in time we go, the margin of error gets huge at that point as well. Okay, so but these are not the caves we're talking about, these Brighton Winter Caves in Germany, which is what I'm going to read the account to you right now, from Greater Ancestors. And I think also Barbara DeLong covered this on her website, actually, and talks about it. She just gives the same account as this, but, you know, gives her, 
you know, sort of uh, examination and questioning of what is actually being said here. But it's so interesting that this goes so far back in time. And we have a more modern expedition that went there. You can actually see the YouTube uh, video of it. Uh, some young fellow went there, I guess, in a 20-something, 12 or something like that. Went in there and did some filming. You can see some still photos on Great Air Ancestors from that YouTube video, I believe. And um, you can watch that. You know, perhaps I can get that link in there as well. <clears throat> and, you know, you can take a look at this. It's just, you ha again, you know, again, I just, you know, admonish everybody to put on their forensic hats when looking at these things and think about all the accounts of the giants that we've heard about, including the Lovelock Cave people in particular, which I think is just basically an out-and-out -out giant genocide. Of course it was, you know, that's the whole story of it. But did these people really deserve it? They were called tool eaters for people who are cannibals. They weren't called baby eaters or man eaters or children eaters or anything you might expect. You know, they call them tool eaters, this aquatic plant, okay? Why would you call them tool eaters if they were, uh, you know, busy eating baby arms, or, you know, for snacks or whatever it is? Doesn't make any sense. So, look, did they deserve to die, the giants and all that kind of stuff? It just came this time and because of probably centuries and centuries of propaganda against them and their rule going back into the far distant past probably for a lot of centuries where it was all just okay or whatever it is but you know you always have those people who don't like the way things are arranged but let's take a look at this thing and it's a you know it's, it's a long story but it's very interesting it's quite interesting to hear about how ambitious these people were and about uh, doing this uh, exploration of this it looks seems to be like an underground city and, you know, was it an underground city of giants? Well, apparently it was. And uh, there may have been average-sized people down there. And, you know, look, again, folks, it almost shows signs like of what I've been talking recently about the Hopewell and the Adina. All right, and these people being so similar. And then we're reading about in France about these seashells that came hundreds and hundreds of miles from the coast, okay? And you're trying to tell me they didn't have a similar trading network going on in Europe and similar dynamics going on there in Europe with the giants ruling over average sized people. We have remnants today about them, okay, without going all into it. But just listen to what's said here. And, uh, you know, it's just a, it's not, it's, has a great description it's a great very good descriptive story so you know there's a lot of details in there so let's look at it here it's the brighton winter case i guess question mark because i guess it's not a place that's noteworthy or anything and why why not why isn't it seems to be like this phenomenal fantastic find from an uh, archaeological uh, and uh, anthropological viewpoint why, why is it in an important place? Why don't people know about it? Nobody goes there. Nobody cares about it. They don't study it. What's going on? Okay, so a Bavarian catacomb located in a cave on the German-Swiss border containing thousands of normal and not-so-normal giant human bones. The normal-sized bones are found burned and brittle in a massive mound of bones, wood, and ash, as if something, somebody was trying to burn them all up. Okay, like as we've heard and they've said from mainstream academia, okay, that most of these people, the average people were cremated at that time. It's just well known, you know, that's why you don't find a lot of the people and it should be like millions and millions of people here in the Americas, according to Charles C. Mann and the anthropologist and archaeologist he's talked to should have been millions and millions of people here where they all go we should find just millions of bones not that they don't find some places where there's just bones for you know acres and acres and acres they find that too we, we read about accounts of that in the americas okay maybe part of this giant genocide and this itself may be another you know giant genocide along with the people of Aversites who are loyal to these people, okay? So imagine there was this internal strife going on, which happened at some point in the past, you know, probably all around the world, and the Bible may be even the starting point of that, you know? 
Okay, is this a massive burial cave for an ancient race of giants? Here are two graphics taken during an expedition Wilfred Lorenz another, and another explorer made into Bright Winter Cave in 1976. After reading documentation of a 1535 exploration by Berthold Buchner and local residents of Amberg. Wilfred Lorenz is the individual and left-hand graphic. I, you know, I can't, maybe we can't see that here. I don't know, but here they are, the caves, I guess the entrance to the caves. And here's, you know, part of this, you know, cardiac system that they're talking about here, type of cave it is. He describes very little except the removal of bones and how he found the cave. The current condition of the Bright and Winter Cave is a picture of total senseless destruction. And here's the actual article here, okay, and it's from 1535, in this account, Buchner speaks of giant human bones, huge skulls, statues, and ghosts in the cave. And so let me read it to you here, and it just, you know, having gone through all the accounts and studied all of them, and I haven't brought all of them to you on the channel because it just takes too long. There's too many of them in certain states, but I've read through all of them, you know, and I took the ones that were most interesting that I could and I felt were, you know, good for the uh, video, but I had to leave a lot out because it just went on and on and on in places like California and Ohio and Indiana, you know, just, you know, on and on and on with the giant stuff. That's why I say so many of the accounts in the Americas, it seems it's the proliferation of giants comes the other way around, folks, from the much, much older world in the Americas that we don't know anything about, because we're learning about it here. And perhaps part of that story is how they proliferated into Europe from the Americas, you understand? And they were these smaller giants, the Bell Beaker people, okay? And, and all the similar types of dynamics that were going on were going on in Europe as well, and in the UK as well, okay? Albion there, the Atlanta Giants, okay? The same kind of dynamics were going on everywhere in Europe as they was going on in the uh, Americas, all right? And they don't know it. It's like a completely unknown story going on there that they're just completely unaware of. It's just totally part of their past in Europe there. And these accounts demonstrate it. All right. So we're talking about maybe an underground city here. It is 1535 by this Buchner fellow. Okay. And official, remember. Remarkable tidings from the day of St. Peter and St. Paul in the year 35, 25 citizens of the town of Amberg set off to a mountainous area three miles distant from Amberg. Near the village of Fredenwind, they went into a huge hollow mountain, about 900 klafter, 1,700 meters deep and walk through to the other side. The marvels they saw there have been written down by Berthold Buchner. The ignorant will not be, believe this story. The experienced ones will not think it possible, but we have seen it with our own eyes, and it is the truth. 1535. In the evening of the day of St. Peter and St. Paul, the above-mentioned 25 men set off from the Ambar from Amberg with a cart with ladders, materials for making fire, stone breaking tools, ropes, wine, bread, and other items useful for such an undertaking. They went to the marketplace of Ho Hohenberg and stayed overnight. The next day they started very early and at 5 a.m. they met at the entrance of the huge mountain and debated. Two of us were appointed leaders to whom we others promised obedience, etc. When, then we got ready to go into the hole, which is so wide that one could turn a wagon of hay in it. Each of us had to carry something, a piece of rope, a light, lanterns, pickaxe, wine, bread, etc. And we sang cheerfully, we are traveling in the name of God. All right, so we're traveling in the name of God down there at this early, early date, and there's quite a few of them to witness all these things.
And, you know, again, you know, they witnessed all these amazing things. Well, we heard about it, those kinds of accounts in the Americas. One that I recall there and somewhere in the West where they went into these caves and it was a figurine planted in the middle of a floor in the middle of these giant skeletal remains where there was um, natural gas burning, you know, a flame coming out of the mouth of this figurine. Looks like a warrior statue there, probably for thousands of years, undisturbed, just burning there in a the cave. Plenty of oxygen for it, you know, just enough for it to burn. Nothing ever happened. Just burning for thousands of years through this figure in there. Just amazing. One of the leaders went in first. The other leader brought up the rear. He secured the entrance with the rope and marked it with signs to avert danger. Because if we should lose track of the ropes, it would have been impossible for us to get out again. After fastening the ropes to a rock, we descended 500 clafter, 950 meters deep. Four honest, strong men were selected to keep watch at the mouth of the mountain cave. Very soon we arrived at a very narrow cleft. One of our companions, a goldsmith who at home had desired to be the first one in the cave, was so frightened by the sight of it that he deserted us, notwithstanding his promise. But we crept on our stomach some 50 clafter, 95 meter, through this narrow cleft. There was a wider opening next to it, but it did not stretch very far. First of all, we came upon a wide space like a hall for dancing. When we crept in, we found so many bones that the first of us had to pile them up in one place to make room for us to enter. The bones were very large, as if from giants. We then reached a very narrow hall and had to squeeze through on our stomachs. At 200 clafter, 380 meter, one comes into what seems like a beautiful, spacious palace big enough to hold about a hundred horses. It is lined at the top very handsomely with grown stones, speleothems. There are eight or ten grown pillars and good seats at the sides. Here we found two skulls, which to our surprise were enclosed by the rock. We could hardly hack them out with our tools. Each person took a piece, one the cranium, one the teeth, etc. There were many passages here and everywhere in the mountain. Some of them we explored. All the caves and passages were full of big bones. We searched for about an hour for a hole leading further in. At last our leader found one and we all followed him. The other tunnels met now and then in the mountain. The other tunnels met now and then in the mountain. We were still amazed by the sight of this palace. After 150 clafters, 285 meters, we came across a very narrow cave and we had difficulty in squeezing in. There we heard a strange roaring, crackling and rustling, and more than one of us wished he had stayed home with his wife. Suddenly the cave widened so that we could walk side by side. We took counsel and decided to go on and find out what these wild sounds were. Our leader went in front again, we following. We arrived at another wide space, which we examined carefully. It looked like a chapter house with pews and on one wall, a gallery and a gallery overhead. It was difficult to get up there and I stayed down below. In all the caves, we found many bones. We came to a narrow vault where we found a skull bigger than we had ever seen before. When we tried to squeeze it through the narrow opening, it crumbled like ashes. Okay, so this is where we hear again and again and again about the accounts from the past. And even at this time, and it's such an early time now, okay, they'll often refer to these yellow remains not being that old and everything else. You know, when they have this just tremendous antiquity and they're just not prepared to admit all the stuff because the past isn't with giant people and giant hominids and humanoids and it's, you know, pretty standard one with just us around and whatnot. So it crumbled like dust. This is where the people like people like Dr. Ken Fader from the university there in Connecticut, you know, the anthropologist there who's wrote all kinds of books about hoaxes that were already done and written about a thousand times. Okay, so it's like, you know, says, you know, uh, we got to produce a skeletal remains of a giant. Well, you know, where are they and all this kind of stuff? Well, you know, here's what happened. I mean, this is why when they say, oh, well, this skeleton shows uh, damage to the pituitary land shows in the skull and everything. Okay, you got these things crumbling to dust. 
how could they tell these things, okay? It could be all this damage to the skull just from aging and all this kind of stuff, okay? So every single one of them they dig up is suffering from gigantism and, uh, you know, uh, all these other diseases that have to do with this sort of thing. It's ridiculous, okay? It's, it's nonsense, okay? Through a narrow entrance, we got down further, about 200 cleft or 380 meters. There was more and more roaring and rustling till we came upon a fairly wide opening where an enormous waterfall was rushing down between two rocks. With such a force, it would have been sufficient to turn two wheel, mill wheels. The stream ran downwards over the opening. We are, were curious to know where this stream came from or find its spring, as it was so icy cold, but we could not follow it. Our leader got stuck there in a cave. He had to be pulled out, otherwise he would have died. The same happened to me. I felt very weak afterwards, and the apothecary gave me a restorative. Adjoining this wide cave was a handsome triangular wall. I wonder what that was restorative was. Some kind of, uh, you know, drugs probably from back then, you know, and if you needed that stuff, they gave it to you, you know. Adjoining this, uh, this wide cave was a handsome triangular vault. There we found a stone sculpture. It resembled a deity seated on a throne with a straw wreath on its head. The straw was black and very brittle. I and some others took some straw home. We found another stone sculpture hanging from a high wall. We left a light burning in front of it. At 200 clafter, 380 meters, we found loose soil with a great many bones. We crept and walked on following the rope. And at 250 clafter, 475 meters, we came to a most wonderful palace and tabernacle. On the other side, between the south and west point, we found a fountain with four stone pillars around it. And there seemed to have been seats there at one time. The fountain was very cold. We hung our wine bottles in it, and the wine was soon cooled. While we refreshed ourselves at the fountain, we heard a loud noise in the cliff where the stream ends. Our leader was bold enough to climb in, but got stuck and became drenched. When we came to his rescue with, with lights, one of us called Bergstaller was struck on the head. It could have damaged one eye. We thought a female figure had been the thrower. Bergstall was very superstitious, so perhaps it was a ghost. We did not see anything else. A ghost. It was very strange that the dripping water, which falls into this mountain in 60 places, freezes into a very hard, even rock and into translucid stone. From some caves, white salt-like stuff trickles out. It looks like glass, and we took it to be saltpeter. In a cliff of the rock, one of our, our companions found a strong gray curly hair, which he assumed was from a beard. All of us were curious to find out more about the ghost and would have faced further adventures and dangers. But we lost the passages in caves where we saw the ghost and were forced to climb to the surface with the rope and soon reached daylight again. Just then, uh, something or rather, with two horses passed the entrance of the cave and we called to him to come in. But on seeing us, he rode away hurriedly. We all looked discolored and were terrified at each other's appearance. We looked like corpses and startled the guards at the entrance. But thanks to God, nobody was hurt. Praise be to God, now and forever. Amen. This has been written down by Berthold Buchner, who took part and is attested by the treasurer of Arburg. Okay, so he attested to it with the treasurer of Arburg and his official account here, which sounds awfully... Um, sincere to me, and here's some old, I uh, guess, uh, you know, woodcut of it from back then, showing these, you know, chamber with all these stalactites and stalagmites, you know, what they call these neolithites or whatever they are to them, okay, just interesting, and interesting patterns there for the, the walls in the back there, but the only other historical graphic of the Brighton Winter Cave from explore, uh, exploration by M. Fleurel in 1792, so it was explored again and again, up until, I guess, modern times when they just chose to forget about it, I suppose, okay, so the mass amount of human bones in the Brighton Winter Cave, I imagine it's from 1976, it could be, 
okay, just that the floor is littered with them, it's carpeted with them, and they're stepping all over them here, picking some of them up that I apparently lose, but they look like they're all compacted into the floor somehow, okay, very odd there, with bits of wood, etc., large human bone taken from a Brighton Winter Cave, okay, large human bone, right, they're measuring it here, and, you know, whatever it is, if it's beyond five foot three to five foot five, is like 165 centimeters or something like that, or whatever it is, it's somebody of unusual stature, and it just can't just say it willy-nilly that every single one of these things is just some freak of nature or gigantism or acromegaly, okay? Every single one of them being that they're so rare, how could that possibly be? Okay, just the people of different hominids and humanoids wandering around in the past that they just don't want to admit to because they have to, they have to figure out what the whole other story is. Okay, it's just not one that they've been told when they're in school. So you know they have their sheepskins there, their diplomas and their uh, you know professorships and whatnot, and they can't jeopardize any of that by trying to admit that they don't really know what went on in the past at all. So. You're not going to admit to anything so easily. Okay, so where is the cave? So I guess uh, they show it here, the Brighton Winter Cave Complex there. I see the topography here. It doesn't look particularly mountainous, but, you know, it's, you know, this sort of rough area there. And then it descends below ground like a city. It seems like a city. Okay. So that's the end of the article there. But I thought that was absolutely fascinating. All right. And I think here, okay, you can see um, there's a YouTube video about it here on YouTube Giants of the Cave, Bright Winter Cave. Okay. I watched a little bit of it. It goes through this cave here with these bones and bones. I'll put a link to it there, all right, if I can, and look through it there. It's just, it seems to me, and it seems so similar to the Lovelock Cave, all right, that they may have burned these giants out, you know, smothered them, smoked them out in these caves, and the people that were loyal to them, all these people were just executed, genocided there by the people who were, I guess, you know, separatists, possibly, it came that time for the giants to be genocided, and they were, and I guess, in these underground cities that might have belonged to their ancestors in the past, similar to the Lovelock case or whatever, okay, and remember, the Lovelock case, this is where you hear the story of the Lovelock case, when they tell the story about it, it's always about the giants in the cave, you don't hear anything else, all these people, whoever it is, L.A. Marzulli and Steve Quayle are here on Coast to Coast, and it's repeated over and over and over again, okay, you don't think about these giants, you only think about the cave and the giants, but that's not true, okay, because mainstream academia tell you all about it, the Lovelock people were the people who lived in the area there, not just in the caves, okay? That's maybe where they retreated to, running away from these homicidal maniacs who've been living on this propaganda for centuries about how the, you know, the giants were cannibal, these tool eaters, these aquatic plant eater people, okay, with these perfect teeth and everything else, all right? And all these red meat eating people, so have all these rotten teeth and you know, maize eating people, you know, okay? Look, so whatever it might be there, it just it doesn't make a lot of sense. But it seems to me that this could be, again, part of the giant genocide of the past, along with their loyal subjects there, people of average height, all, you know, smothered to death in these caves, and then they tried to burn them later on. How can you burn them all? Okay, they run out of oxygen pretty fast. Okay, with all the wood in there, etc. So, again, I just say put on your forensic caps and think about this one here. Okay, and about the giant skull that turned into dust when they tried to remove it. And, you know, people like Dr. Ken Fader say, you know, produce a giant skull. And he knows perfectly well nobody can produce. And what happened to all these old, you know, giant skeletons? He knows perfectly well what happened to them. They disintegrated into dust. 
That's why he says, oh, produce a giant skeleton, because he knows we can't. All right, none of them survived. They weren't treated properly. They were dug up everywhere without knowing how to probably treat them, probably chemically somehow. I don't know if they could have done that in the past. Some early attempts at it with shellacking the bones, etc. And whatever ones did survive were promptly bought up by the Smithsonian, okay, sent their agents around, buying up all of these things, and then they just disappeared. Okay, so similar thing going on here, it seems to me, at these bright, bright winter caves. Okay, another giant genocide going on in here. You have all part of the same story, probably during the same timeline, okay, of this rather large civilization going on, you know, shared cultures going on on either side of the Atlantic here at a specific timeline of the giants, okay, with Neolithic starting points. I mean, as again, you know, again, Jimmy and I went up on Mount Ephraim there. You can see it in my videos there. This huge stone and contest of strength, as they refer to them themselves, the researchers in these fields and the tales of old and myths and everything in Europe there. The same thing was going on in the Americas with these giant dolmen and uh, split stones, by the way. Some of them artificial and some of them natural. They have reverence for these things and stone in general. But... Okay, so in any case, guys, I hope you enjoyed that article here about this rather old account from 1535, an official account, it seems, and it's just fascinating what they found there, and then what do we know about it today, except these, you know, uh, you know, uh, underground videos done here on YouTube about people willing to venture there and take a look at these things and then mainstream academic is silent about the whole thing because they don't want to tell us about this story folks and they just don't want to get into it it's, it's nice and neat and nice and uh, antiseptic for them the way they understand it now and that's the way they give it to us and are always trying to teach us these theoretical things as actual facts and proofs when they aren't to actually proofs at all all right so anyway hope you enjoyed that one please do hit the like button if you enjoyed that account there and um, if you're not a subscriber please do subscribe because we have some very interesting takes on the channel on several different subjects and uh i hope to be speaking about these things in an interview i'll be doing for conflict radio and just the people on that channel are going to hear some very different ideas than they heard so far in all the interviews done on that channel so it's, it's going to be an eye-opening experience for those people anyway coming up soon on december 14th on uh conflict radio all right guys anyway budcat7 signing out uh peace folks